Good morning. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning at New Beginnings Baptist Church. Please stand as you're able as we begin worship time this morning singing Living Hope. Your very body. 
Well, good morning. Good morning. You guys sounded good this morning. I love to come and sing praises. And just this morning, it's just a, a beautiful opening song we had. Um, a handful of announcements. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone who came out to help yesterday with our cleanup streeter day. Um, we had I think, 13 people. We went from Walmart um, to Lori's mailbox, and we filled the back of my truck heaping full of stuff we picked up along that way. And so it was a very successful event. And it was a little cool. We <laughs> were buying sweatshirts and trying to keep warm a little bit yesterday, oddly enough. I had to turn the uh, boiler on this morning. I just turned it off this week, and I had to turn it back on this morning to heat up our building this morning. So again, thank you to everyone who came and helped make that project yesterday so it's such a success. Um, reminder that in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow, we start our Backyard Bible School. Okay, and again, three locations, six classes. We have a team coming that's going to help us, but we need workers. I need probably at least 10 or 12 from our church that'll help with that. Um, I have a sign-up sheet right outside the door in the back, and if you're able to help with that, put your name down, um, and um, if there's something specific that you're planning to do, let me know, and I'll talk to you about that. We're going to be assigning roles this week. Um, for example, example, I know one person that isn't available during the week, but they want to make sure they help with the, the um, block party we're doing on Thursday. Um, write that down. and just Anything you're going to help with that week, just note on that, and then I'll be in contact this week as we begin to make those final arrangements and we put everybody in place of where they're going to be that week. So again, Backyard Bible School, two weeks from tomorrow. Um, the team will be with us um, that's coming from Texas um, two weeks from today. Also, um, Katie's reminding me, uh, her and Ruth Grant have worked hard on our library uh, downstairs. It's right across from the office. You haven't seen it. It looks really, really nice. There's a system in place where you can go in by yourself and you can check out a book. You just got to sign a, a card so we know where the books are. Um, and it's all organized. And make use of that. I know a lot of churches have libraries that go unused. And so I, I hope that you guys will use our library. I mean, it's, it's now organized. You can find the books. And, so please make use of that library. Um, for those of you who ordered t-shirts and haven't picked them up yet, um, Jeannie Blakemore is taking care of that. She'll be in the back room this morning um, and she'll be collecting money and handing out shirts for all of you that ordered t-shirts. I know a lot of you have already picked them up, but again, they're here and they're ready to go if you ordered one of the t-shirts. Um, reminder, um, next Saturday, there's two things happening next Saturday. First of all, we have our farmer's market. Um, we've already filled out this for the month of July, who's gonna be working each Saturday, but all summer long, every Saturday we'll be at the farmer's market and handing out some literature and handing out waters. Um, I think I've already talked to people who are working next Saturday, so that's all worked out, but, but be praying for that. Also, next Saturday is opening day at the camp, and so everyone's invited from, from the streeter, from our church, Come on out for the day. They're going to have um, snow cones and hay rides, and you want to come out and fish, whatever you want to do. Jacob would love to have you come out and just tour the camp that day. And so come be a part of that. And then um, July 11th, now it's a ways out yet, right? July 11th. July 11th, we have a camp day for our church. Um, we're going to basically, after church, it's a Sunday. Everybody's going to have lunch on their own. And then about 2 o'clock, anyone who wants to, come out to the camp, and we're going um, to fish that afternoon. Uh, if you don't want to fish, come out a little later, but about 5 or 6 o'clock then, we're going to grill some hot dogs, um, and just, hot, just simple hot dogs and, and potato chips, and then we're going to have a campfire that night, we're going to um, probably do some s'mores, some music around, the, sing some songs around the campfire, and maybe do a hayride as well. So again, that's July 11th. Um, I know it's a ways out, but I wanted you guys to know that that's coming up as well. Um, and then, um, two other things. One, two... Um, Remind you, this morning, for the first time since in many months, we're actually passing an offering plate. So just a moment, I'm going to invite our deacons, our, our, our people collecting offering to come forward to help with that. Um, and so this is the first time. It seems like things are starting to get back to normal. And so I'm excited about that as well. And then we want to certainly, certainly not forget Memorial Day. I'm recognizing that all those that gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And so um, we want to recognize that today. So um, let me pray. Um, actually, I could have um, those that are helping with our offertory, if they would come forward at this point.
Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege of worship, that we can come together and just praise your name, give you the glory that you so deserve. Let our words, our, our message today, our songs just be pleasing to your ears, Lord, as we just praise you this day. Lord, I recognize Memorial Day. We thank you for all those that have gone before, who have given ultimate sacrifice for freedom, Lord. We recognize them this day. We thank them for that. Lord, I ask that you um, take these offerings that we're collecting, Lord, and you would use them for, for your glory, Lord. You use, use them to advance the gospel in Streeter and throughout the U.S. and throughout the world as we share in world missions as well, Lord. Use them for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
8612 states, excuse me, I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. Let's continue singing, glorify thy name. Imagine, if you will, surveys tell us that two-thirds of Americans believe that there is no hell. Can you imagine this being true? Let me state for the record, before we even begin, that I do believe in the existence of heaven and of hell. But there are many misguided theories these days about the afterlife that, that people have simply made up. And in this passage today that we're studying, Jesus talks about a place called hell. Now, most people don't like talking about hell. And it's probably been a long time since you've heard a message where people talked about hell. Do you remember John Lennon's song from 1971 called Imagine? It's actually a beautiful song that if you stop and listen to the lyrics are, are horrible. They're horrible lyrics. It's the ultimate existentialism theme song. And let me define existentialism for you. That's a philosophy that emphasizes individual existence, individual freedom, individual choice. And people who follow this believe that there is no God. And the only meaning in life is to embrace existence itself. Let me give you a couple, couple lines from that song. I know you've heard the song. 
Psalm says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. It says no hell before it, below us, oh, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. See, John Lennon saw himself as a dreamer, but his dream died in 1980 when he was shot in New York City. And I'm sure his afterlife, he got a different view. I like most pastors, if, if given a choice, if you want to preach on heaven or you want to preach on hell, I'm going to default to talking about heaven. There's churches that have done long studies. There wasn't that long ago, uh, Randy Alcorn wrote a book titled exactly that, titled Heaven. It's a great book, actually, and, and he, he sought out all kinds of answers about heaven in his book. And, and I know pastors who have, have used that book along with the Bible and done Wednesday night or Sunday night sermons and messages on heaven. And I know one pastor in southern Illinois that spent a year and a half every week doing messages on heaven. It's a great topic. It's easy to talk about heaven. It's harder to preach about hell. And while I have heard messages that, that reference hell, they're few and far between today. Well, one of the values that we have in teaching through the Bible verse by verse, as we do here, is that I can't practice what some call kangaroo exegesis. That's where you, where you just go through the text, and when you come to something that's unpleasant, that you hop over and just go on to the next passage, right? You can't jump over things and go to the next. You're forced to look at that next passage, to study that next passage, and that's where we find ourselves at today. Last week, we, we were in Mark chapter 9 is where we're at if you're looking for the text. But last week, we talked about how the disciples of Jesus had been arguing. Do you remember what they were arguing about? They were arguing about who was the greatest among them. And to prove a point, Jesus, in that message, he takes a, a little child in his arms and he says, If you want to be great, you must humble yourselves as a child. And then he continues, he, and our text today moves us into chapter 9, verses 42 to 49. Join with me. Again, Mark 9, 42 to 49. It says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and again to be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Some of you may remember the true story a number of years ago about Aaron Ralston. In 2003, he was hiking when, when this huge boulder dislodges, and he gets trapped in this narrow canyon. And he's there for, for a long time. After actually 127 hours, he was trapped, if you remember his story. And after trying to get out, he came to Tuckington Dew, and he's going to starve to death, and he's, he's, he's hurt. And he finally, after that period of time, he, he, in determination, he takes a pocket knife he has, and he ends up severing his, his right arm. He cut it off so he could be freed from that, from that trap spot that he was in. After that, he... he, he he survived, and he writes a book. He wrote a book called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Good title, right? And for many years, he traveled as a motivational speaker, telling of his experience and trying to encourage people. Well, in this passage today, Jesus was not speaking about literally cutting off your hands or cutting off your feet or, or gouging out. He wasn't literally telling you to do that. He's using extreme exaggeration. You can say extreme hyperbole. He's trying to emphasize a point to talk about the difference between enjoying what he's calling entering life and experiencing the agonies of hell. He tells us it'd be better to go through life maimed than to be thrown into hell. We know the source of sin 
isn't your hands. It's not your feet. It's not your eyes. In Mark 7, Jesus made, his, made it clear that, that, the, that the source of sin is our wicked heart. One pastor said it this way. He said, the, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. This, pro, this passage is not about amputation. It's about the extreme agony of hell. Cutting off your hand is, is pretty agonizing, right? But it's nothing. Nothing compared to the horror of hell. So we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to talk about hell this morning. And I realize that it's, it's not a pleasant topic. It's actually a very unpleasant topic, right? But sometimes discussing unpleasant topics can be the most loving thing that we can do. I remember when my dad was diagnosed with cancer about a year ago. I remember a loving doctor telling him the truth. Telling him exactly what was going to happen and the options he had before him. That's a loving thing that a doctor does for their patient, to share truth with them. A doctor could have, have, have not told him the truth and, and it would not have led to good things, right? Sharing unpleasant truth is sometimes the most loving thing we can do. It's only when correct information is given and shared that, that we can make wise decisions about treatment that we can make informed decisions. When it comes to belief in heaven and hell, Americans are very fickle. According to a Barner Research Group, 71%, 71% of Americans believe in heaven. It's pretty good, right? But less than half of that, 32%, believe in a literal place called hell. And when asked, only 2%, 2 out of 100 Americans believe they will end up in hell. So again, as we look at this text, we see that most Americans, these statistics show that most Americans are taking John Lennon's advice. They're imagining there is no hell below us. Now you might expect non-Christians to deny the existence of hell, but, but there are many people who call themselves Christian who have also imagined hell away. There's been some popular preachers, and I, I use that term loosely in this, that have, that have questioned the reality of hell. Rob Bell, who, who formed a, was a, a pastor who, who formed Mars Hill a number of years ago in Michigan. He wrote a book entitled Love Wins, in, in which he denied the existence of hell. Let me read what he wrote in his book. He wrote, a staggering number of people have been taught that a select few Christians will spend forever in a peaceful, joyful place called heaven while the rest of humanity spends forever in torment and punishment in hell with no chance for anything better. This is misguided and toxic and, and ultimately subverts the contagious spread of Jesus' message of love, peace, and forgiveness. Rob Bell is, is a great communicator. But, and he, again, he has the right to believe what he wants. Maybe that's what you believe, but he is so far from what the Bible teaches us. So far from truth. I will say, fortunately, he is no longer a pastor, but he is still writing books. He's still sharing his viewpoint that does not align with this book. Church, one of, one of the most important issues you'll have to settle for yourself is whether or not you believe in the existence of hell. Of hell. So the first part of this message, I want to do something a little strange. I want to, let's take the position of John Lennon and Rob Bell. Now, I'm hesitant to do that because, because it's one of those messages that, that, that you have to look at in the entirety. I always I say this because I, I said to one of our deacons this morning, I'm, I, I, I'm hesitant that somebody's going to click on our online message and they're going to hear one or two lines of my message and take it out of context. But let's take that role for a minute. Imagine there's no hell. Again, two-thirds of Americans take this role. And can they be wrong? If we go down that line of thinking, what do you have to do to eliminate the idea of hell? And again, before you take me literally, I want to state for the record that I do believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. But I'm going to tell you what you have to do to eliminate the horrible idea of hell. So here you go, four ways. First of all, throw this book away. Get rid of this book. If you're going to get rid of hell, you have to throw this book away because it's filled with references to eternal punishment to those who reject God's offer of eternal life. 
liberal theology crept into to seminaries in the, in the beginning of the 20th century. These liberal theologians, they, they apologized for biblical truth. They, they felt called to, to rescue Christianity from its historical roots. The first doctrine in the fall was the inspiration of the Bible. And some of them claimed that the Bible was no longer inspired. And suddenly it was, it was no longer inspired word of God. It was just a collection of writings by men, they said. And then very quickly, the next doctrine in the fall was that of hell. They, they claimed that that doctrine slandered the character of God. There were popular preachers like Henry Emerson Fosdick who, who preached against the reality of hell. Fosdick was pastor of Riverside Church in, in New York City in the 20s and the 30s. He mocked Jonathan Edwards' sermons. Jonathan Edwards had a very famous sermon titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards would, would preach against them. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Fosdick would preach against that. He, he would come out and he would talk about that sermon and he would say, surely we don't believe in a God like that anymore. So again, if you're going to imagine a way hell, first you have to toss, toss out this book. You have to toss out so many scriptures. The Bible says in, in Revelation 20, 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And while you're tossing that verse away, go ahead, toss away Revelation 21, 8 that says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now we have to admit, that doesn't sound very nice, right? Getting back to John Lennon's song again, the nice thought, no hell below us. Maybe it makes us feel better. But the truth is that this book is full of warnings. It's full of information about judgment. It's full of information about hell. Maybe we need more self-help books, like how to be happy in three days or less, right? There's tons of those books out there. But if you want to eliminate hell, first of all, you have to eliminate the Bible. And the second thing you have to do is you have to ignore the words of Jesus. The day Jesus was born, the angels announced to the shepherds, today in the city of David, a Savior has been born who is Christ the Lord. But wait a minute. If you're going to eliminate health, why do we need a Savior, right? There's nothing to be saved from. Folks, Jesus spoke about hell more than any other individual in the Bible. The word Jesus used for this was Gehenna, which was a comparison to the valley in Jerusalem, which was called Gehenna in Hebrew. That valley still exists in Jerusalem today, but and I've not been to Jerusalem, but um, this valley uh, was an area that no one would dare live in. I'm told that tour guides, when, when, when a group goes through, they'll, they'll say things about the area. They'll say, like, folks to the left, we see hell, the, the place where pagans practiced um, child sacrifices and bodies of the unclaimed corpses would burn with a stench of smoke that, that rose from this area. Now, Jesus did not say that this place, this valley, was hell. But you see, it was the worst place imaginable in Israel. So Jesus compared it to the place of eternal torment. So again, if you're going to get rid of hell, you have to ignore everything Jesus said about it. Let me give you a couple of those verses, just a few of them. You're going to have to ignore some statements like Matthew 20, 10, 28. that says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one. Look at Luke 16, 23 and 24. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Let me give you one more. Matthew 13, 42 says, They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are harsh words. Again, they don't fit with John Lennon's song. Imagine everyone living in peace. The third thing you have to do if you want to eliminate the idea of hell is you have to avoid 
The crazy Christians. There's plenty of extreme Christians out there, isn't there? People who will talk about hell and, and talk about what it means to have hell or to go to hell. People who will witness to other people because they don't want to see people go to hell. Earlier I mentioned Jonathan Edwards. He wasn't some uneducated redneck. Jonathan Edwards was a Yale University valedictorian at the age of 17. In addition to theology, he was fascinated by science. He wrote papers on, on light, on optics. And he first preached his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in 1741. And through preaching this message, it was the beginning of the first great spiritual awakening in our country. Church, if, if Jonathan Edwards were here today, he'd be labeled a nutcase for preaching such a scary sermon. But the one man who, who has preached to more people than anyone else today is Billy Graham, right? Now, some people have falsely said that Billy Graham didn't believe in hell. Let me give you some things he said in a, in a crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, 1958. He said, Jesus warned us in no uncertain terms against going to hell. And he used the most terrible language to describe it. The Bible calls it the second death. The Bible calls it a lake of fire and brimstone. I believe that one minute after death, those outside of Christ will discover the horrible mistake they have made, and they will say, my God, my God. Well, that, you say that was 58. What about you? He, he lived a lot, long time after that. Well, at the age of 96, he said, when Christians die, they go straight into the presence of Christ, but an unsaved sinner, their destiny is separation from God, a place Jesus called hell. Again, pretty harsh words, aren't they? Not the feel-good message of, of your best life now on TV. That preacher who preaches your best life now, again, I'm using the word preacher very, very, very loosely. He says he believes in hell, but, but he never talks about it because it's unpleasant. Instead, he wants, he said, God wants you to be wealthy, happy, and healthy. Well, church, there's another way. Another thing you have to do you want to avoid hell. The other way you can avoid hell is not die. I may laugh at that because we know that people are living longer, right? We have, we, have, we have different medicines and people are living longer and longer. And fitness, fitness is a good thing. We should, we should all choose to, to live healthy lives and extend the usefulness of our bodies, this, this temple we have of the Holy Spirit. But there are some who think that, that death is something to be feared, to be avoided at all costs. They want to live forever, but, but not in heaven, right? Not in hell. They, they want to live forever here on earth. It's amazing some of the things that are taking place. There, there's an organization that's been around for a long time in Scottsdale, Arizona, called the Outdoor Life Extension Foundation. It's where when you die, they will freeze your body. They'll preserve it until a time in the future when they predict medical science will be so advanced that they can fix it for whatever cause it was that you died. Then they'll thaw you out, you'll be revived, right? I looked it up. You can do it. Maybe you're wondering, it's two hundred thousand dollars to do that. Maybe you think that's out of your budget. So there's a secondary, you can just have your head done for eighty thousand dollars. And there's more than two hundred frozen clients of this business today. One of who is believed to be Ted Williams, baseball star. I've also, just as a side note, of the 200 plus, over half of them are just the heads. And so I'm not exactly sure what happens for the bodies in the future for that as well. But, so if, again, if you want to get rid of hell, don't die. Of course, it's, it's going to be tough to do because the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Psalms 90, 10 says, our days may come to 70 years or 80 years if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So if the idea of hell repulses you, it's not something you want to talk about, you can take John Lennon's advice. Try to imagine there is no hell. But be clear. Hear me today. If you do this, if you reject the idea of hell, you do so at your own risk. 
It's also a popular belief in America today that there are not absolute truths, that all truth is relative. It means that, that there may be truth for you, but it's not truth for me. And, and here, there are relative truths. I mean, for instance, depending on what part of the country you live in, 60 degrees may be considered cool temperatures. In other parts of the country, it may be considered a very warm temperature. It's a relative truth. Some people believe that Domino's has the best pizza in town, and obviously they're wrong because we all know that Joe's has better pizza, right? But again, that's a relative truth. But some truths, truths are absolute. You can disagree over the best pizza, but it's an absolute truth that if you eat pizza for three meals a day, every day of the week, that it's not going to be healthy for you. It's not a relative truth. It's an absolute truth. And the truth about hell is not a relative truth. It's an absolute truth. Again, it's either true or it's a lie. There's no middle ground. When I, my dad came to Christ before he died, he remembered, I remember him asking, it was a week before he died, he said, how do we know that it's true? And I said, Dad, either this book is completely true or none of it's true. There is no middle ground. Again, I mentioned earlier, I believe in a literal hell. But God has gone to extraordinary lengths to prevent you from spending your eternity there. Have you ever noticed when you're driving that when there's dangerous roads, there's curves, that there's, there's steep inclines, that there's icy spots or, or slick spots on the road, that they have signs out warning you of what the road condition looks like? They're trying to warn you. They're, they're trying to tell you that this is a dangerous area. Slow down. Be careful. Avoid this location. Jesus is telling us there's a dangerous road that leads to death, that leads to destruction. And God has put plenty of roadblocks up to warn people. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13, even though, I'm sorry, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. I want to give you three roadblocks to help. First roadblock is God's will. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but instead he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, that, that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't initially intended for human habitation. You say, well, well wait a minute, if, if God's will is for everyone to be saved, won't everyone then be saved? No. God's will is not always done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus taught us to, to pray for God's will to be done. There is one area of the universe where God has voluntarily restricted his control, and that area is that of your will. He didn't create Adam and Eve so that they could not sin. Again, he gave them free will. And God will not force anyone to accept his offer of eternal life. He will not override your will. Second roadblock we see is the witness of concerned Christians. The Apostle Paul was speaking in Athens, Greece. He was addressing the, the most intellectually astute philosophers of that first century. He says in Acts 17, 30 and 31, he says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. In Luke 16, Jesus talks about a rich man who died and woke up in hell and he's crying out to Abraham for help. And Abraham, Abraham at this point says a couple of the scariest words that have been spoken in hell. He says, Son, remember. I won't read the whole verse. He says, Son, remember. I, I believe that if, if someone dies without accepting Jesus, that they will remember. They'll remember every experience where a Christian witnessed to them. They'll remember every gospel message they've ever heard, including this one today. 
And if you're listening to my words today, in person or online, God is using me today to warn you of the reality of hell. Today, I am one of those roadblocks warning you to turn around. The third roadblock we see is the cross of Christ. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. The cross. The cross stands as a mighty roadblock warning you away from hell. See, Jesus took our punishment. He drank the cup of God's wrath so we don't have to. And when Jesus died on the cross, he experienced hell. Hell's darkness. The Bible says when Jesus was dying, it became dark, dark at noon. Hell is separation from God. And when Jesus took my sins and your sins upon himself, he experienced an alienation from the Father. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus endured hell so we don't have to. Will you? Will you accept the finished work of Christ on that cross? Church, going back to John Lennon's song for a moment, it takes a lot, a lot of imagination to explain away hell, to try to explain away heaven. I want to reference another song. In 1968, the rock group Blood, Sweat, and Tears recorded a song entitled, And When I Die. The song was earlier recorded by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Dale would remind me of that if I didn't say that. The song said, in that song, it said, I swear there ain't no heaven, and I pray there ain't no hell, but I'll never know by living, only by dying will I tell. Let me plead with you. Church, hear me today. Don't wait. Don't wait, as the song says, until after. After is too late. Don't wait until after you die to learn the truth about heaven and hell. Trust Jesus today while you still have that opportunity. I'll tell you a story, true story. 1830, a man by the name of George Wilson was convicted of robbing the U.S. Postal Service. And his sentence was death. Now, thinking that the punishment was too harsh, President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon to him. Seems like that would be the end of it, right? The presidential pardon comes out. That's the way all the TV shows. The presidential pardon comes out, and that's the end, right? But George Wilson did something unusual. He refused the pardon. The attorney general said, wait a minute, wait a minute, he has to accept it. And so Wilson disagreed, and, and so the case goes to court. Does he have to accept the pardon? Chief Justice, Justice John Marshall ruled in favor of Wilson. He wrote, a pardon is a deed, he said, and delivery is not complete without it being accepted. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered. And if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in the court to force it on him. And therefore, George Wilson was hanged. Now you may think it, it's cruel that a court would hang a man who robbed the post office. But George Wilson did not have to die. He chose to reject the pardon. Folks, God is offering you a pardon from hell today. He's offering you forgiveness. He's offering you hope. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. He's offering it. But just like George Wilson had to accept that pardon, you have to accept this offer. And you can reject it, just like George did Folks, he wants you to be saved, but he leaves that choice to you. Have you made that decision? I know this is a different message than we normally preach, right? It's not a normal sermon that we have, but the truth is there. Hell is real. Consider your life today. Have you come to that point in your life where you recognize that, that Christ is the only way, that this book is true and you're going to stake your life upon it? It's all that matters. Someone shared with me this week about a relative who, who was dying and, and found themselves sharing with everyone around them and said they were scared to do that before they were dying. They didn't know why. They, they thought people would laugh at them or people would, would make fun of them. But, but then once they found out they were dying, they no longer had that fear. They regretted not telling people earlier. Folks, it's not about what other people will think. 
When you look at what eternity represents, our time on this earth is so quick, is so short. Don't put off making a decision. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm not going to draw it out. But consider your life. Consider if you're living for Christ. If you've made that decision to live for Him. And, and if you've kept that, or have, you, have you gotten off track and you be brought back and, and recommit your life to Christ? Where are you at in that walk? In a moment, we're going to have invite the music leaders back. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation, a time where we invite you to come. A time where you can commit your life to Christ. A time where you can, if you want to pray with me or by yourself or with one of our deacons, it's a time for you to settle things with our Lord. We invite you to make decisions. Maybe you've been worshiping with us for a while and you want to begin the process of joining this church. Great, we would love to have you. But it's not about this church. Also, it's about you and your relationship with Christ. Musicians, you come back.